Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Swallowfield Chapel. We're so happy you could join us this morning. Uh, my name is Jordan, and this morning our speaker will be Pastor David. This week we continue with a part three of the message titled Charter of Freedom, Live Free. So don't forget to share the link with your family, share it with your friend, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. God bless you as we worship together. Good morning, Solar Field. Join us for worship.
Good morning, church. Let us pray. Lord, we just give you glory. We give you honor. We thank you, Lord, that you're such a great God. Lord, that you're looking out for us, Lord. We come before you now, Lord God, putting our sick before you, Lord. Those, Lord God, in our congregation, Lord, and those adjoined to us, mighty God, who are not doing well, who are not feeling well, we ask for your divine touch, Lord. Oh, Jehovah Rapha, intervene in our situations, Lord Jesus. Lord, you see the mental health impact of COVID-19, Lord God. There's so much more depression. There's so much more abuse, Lord God. We ask for your intervention, Lord Jesus. Lord, we remember those who are grieving at this time, those who have lost loved ones. Lord, we ask, Lord God, for your intervention in those situations. Cause, Lord God, that Lord, they would experience the comfort of your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord God, that you just prove yourself strong. Lord God, demonstrate your loving hand, your comforting hand, Lord God. Cause, Lord God, that they would experience your everlasting arms. Oh Lord, pour out your spirit, Lord, and intervene in these difficult situations. Lord, we remember our nation at large. Lord, remember our leaders. We ask, Lord God, that you would give them wisdom from above. We ask, Lord God, that our leaders would walk in humility, that our leaders would be led by your spirit, Lord God, and even hindered by your spirit, Lord God. Lord, that they would not hit their foot against a stone or make wrong decisions, Lord. We ask, Lord God, that you would pour your spirit over our families across this country. Turn the hearts of our fathers, Lord God, to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. Cause, Lord God, that you would bind up the brokenhearted, Lord God, and where families have been torn apart, Lord God. Cause that forgiveness would reign. Cause, Lord God, that families would be restored. Lord Jesus, we see the crime rate, Lord Jesus. We ask for your intervention, Lord God, and we ask, Lord, that it would be divine, that it would be sustainable, Lord Jesus, that families would be brought back together, that the, our children, mighty God, would grow in stable homes, Lord God, that would defeat forevermore this monster of a crime rate, Lord God, for violent crime, Lord God, is being fed by broken families. We ask, Lord God, for your divine intervention over our churches, Lord God. Cause, Lord God, that we would walk in truth and humility. Cause, Lord God, that we would stand for righteousness, Lord God, and that we would not follow lord god the, the the wind and be tossed by every wind of doctrine or any thought or philosophy in our prevailing world culture at this time let our eyes be fixed on you lord god and let us stand with blazing hearts lord jesus we pray for the young people lord god that we would stand lord god loving you with our whole heart and loving each other lord pour out your spirit we pray and may your bride stand before you mature and filled with passionate love for you in jesus name Amen. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds that have I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display.
The scripture reading is taken from Galatians 3, verses 1 to 14, and we're reading from the NIV. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by meaning of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So again, I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under curse, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it is said, it says, the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. The second reading is taken from Galatians 3, and I will continue reading from verse 15 to the end. Brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. The promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. Scripture does not say, and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. What I mean is this. The law introduced for 30 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. Why then was the law given at all? It was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was given through angels and entrusted to a mediator. A mediator, however, implies more than one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promises of God? Absolutely not. For if a law had been given that could impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come by the law. But scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, might be given to those who believe. Before the coming of this faith, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. This is the word of the Lord.
Greetings. We thank God for His amazing love. And as we come now to share from God's Word and reflect on His Word together, may I invite you to join me in a brief word of prayer. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Asks the Apostle Paul incredulously in his letter to the churches in Galatia. The idea being conveyed by the Apostle is that they were spiritually dull, lacking in understanding, and as a result, they were being duped and misled by charmers, as it were by pretense as by magic arts. Judgment and good reason were being replaced by a kind of fascination or charm. Paul was shocked and was asking, is who fooling up? Who turning in an in a idiot, as we say in Jamaica? And the charmers, the fooling up was being done by Judaizers who were adherents to Judaism. These Jews had infiltrated the churches founded by Paul in Galatia and were teaching that the message of salvation preached by the Apostle Paul was defective. They undermined both the message of Paul as well as the messenger, Paul himself. What an attack. And Paul's message was essentially one of freedom. This freedom, Paul claimed, could only be experienced by belief, by trusting entirely upon God's grace. God's grace, Paul preached, was revealed by Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died for our sins to rescue us from this evil age according to the will of God, his Father. Jesus, according to Paul, was raised from the dead. And so the crooks of salvation therefore rested entirely on the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's entirely a work of God's grace, his unmerited favor to sinners. And so salvation could therefore only be received by faith in Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. The message of the Judaizers, however, was that you had to obey the requirements of the Mosaic law and code in order to be saved, as they interpreted it. 
the Galatian Christians were sadly accepting the teachings of the Judaizers and they were being thrown into confusion. And it is in this context that the apostle utters those rather strong comments. You foolish Galatians, who are fool enough? Who has bewitched you? I want to suggest that the warning of the apostle Paul is, was needed then and is very much needed and timely in our present 21st century world and must also be heeded. And the big message and idea I want to put forward to us today is that we need to be on guard against deception. Paul's comments indicate that deception may come in various ways, various guises. It's bewitching. We may buy into a lie based on, for example, a person's charm, charisma, or message, which may be appealing. Erwin Lutzer writes about the world descending into decadence. He speaks of a period, the period of modernism in our world. Modernism, he, I'm quoting from Lutzer, he says, modernism was the belief that reason had the power to make sense of the world. The human mind, it was thought, had the ability to interpret reality and discover overarching values. It was optimistic, believing in progress, there was the belief that science and history could lead us to various truths that would help us to interpret reality. Modernism, according to Lutz, that attacked religion, particularly Christianity, because it believed Christianity was filled with superstitions. But at least modernism, according to Lutz, believed that truth existed and it was not afraid to say so. Lutz, however, continued and he made the observation that we are according to him, certainly in the Europe and in the West, living in what he describes as a post-modern era, which has developed because reason has failed to make sense of our world. You know, with all of our technology and advancement of intelligence and so on, we have seen a, a plummeting of, of, of human behavior. Man's inhumanity to man is rife. We know of 9-11 and we have seen so many wars. And this has, as it were, brought about this, this, this postmodern world. And in postmodernism, truth is now defined as my personal opinion of reality. And as a result, truth is replaced by fairness, sensuality, and mysticism. And so there are no objective criteria for determining whether something is true or not. I had a conversation with our brethren, Maurice Bailey, years ago. And he shared with me that the present climate is one where there are no certainties, no morals, no absolutes, no God, except the one you care to make. And there are now, for example, some 70 odd recognized and celebrated genders in certain parts of the world. No longer just male and female, but 70. Can you believe that? And so if I wake up and feel I'm a hippopotamus, I am without reference to objective crit criteria such as biology, I am a hippopotamus. I want to submit that in our world, in this scenario, deceivers and their deception abound. The biblical position, however, is that truth may be known. And Paul's defense of the gospel he preached was on the premise of it being truth. It was the only way he submitted of salvation and freedom. And he felt so strongly about it that he said, here are his words in, in chapter 1, verse 8. He says, but even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. That's Galatians 1, 8 and 9. Paul was therefore particularly incensed, angry with the Galatian Christians because they had been taught the truth, they had believed it, but they were now abandoning it. And before their own eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. So they knew about the gospel. In defending the truth of the gospel, Paul employs three main arguments in our text, which was read for us in chapter three. One, the experiential argument, which is found in verses one to five. That is their personal experience. The second argument is a scriptural argument or biblical argument, which he references and, and expounds on in verses 6 to 14 of our text. And then thirdly, the legal argument, which is verses 15 to 29 
of Galatians 3. Let's look at them one by one, the experiential argument, verses 1 to 5. Paul asks his readers some pointed rhetorical questions about their experience. Look at verse 2 and he says, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? Verse 3, are you so foolish or so fool? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing if it really was for nothing? Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you heard? Now, to understand why Paul asked these questions, we must first appreciate the teachings of Scripture about the person and work of the Holy Spirit in salvation. The Holy Spirit, according to the Scriptures, convicts the sinner of sins and reveals Christ to him. And I want to pause to say, even as I speak today, if there is a sense of conviction in your own heart about the rightness and truth of what I'm declaring, it's not about me. It's the Spirit of God at work within you. The Spirit may, the sinner, I'm sorry, may also resist the Spirit of God or may yield to the leading of the Spirit and trust in Jesus Christ. It's your choice. And when a person believes in Christ, he or she is born again, the scripture teaches, by the Spirit of God and receives the very life of God. The Spirit of God comes to live within that person. The believer is also baptized by the Spirit into the body or the family of Christ. And the Bible further teaches that the believer is sealed by the Spirit, who is like a guarantee that one day we will share in the glory of Christ. In other words, the reality of the presence of the Spirit of God in the life of the believer is a guarantee that in a day to come, we will share in Christ's glory. And Paul asks the Galatians to examine now. He says, look at your personal ex experience and answer the question whether they had received the Holy Spirit as a result of following the Mosaic law or whether it was as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ. Their experience had clearly shown that they had received the Spirit of God by believing in Jesus Christ. They had experienced the power of God. They had witnessed the working of miracles in their lives. And as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ, that is how it happened. And so Paul asked the question, why then, in light of all this evidence, are you reverting to human effort in order to attain your goal, which is salvation? Oh, foolish Galatians, only oh, no, suffer fool. The experience of the Galatians should have settled in their minds that the teachings of the Judaizers were clearly erroneous or wrong. I believe perhaps this is a convenient place to ask ourselves the question, do I have a personal experience of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, which is affirmed by the presence of the Spirit of God living in me? Answer that question for yourself. But Paul does not rest his case for the truth of the gospel on the subjective personal experience of the Galatians alone. But he goes on to demonstrate objectively from scripture that the argument of the Judaizers was suspect. And I will pause to make the observation that it is fitting and proper to relate our personal experiences in sharing the gospel in order to demonstrate its validity. Your personal experience is important. We should share it. However, we must also be prepared and equipped to demonstrate objectively why we believe what we believe. Are you working with me? And so the scriptural argument is very important. Verses 6 to 14 of our text. We need to ask the question, what does the word of God have to say on this issue? As believers in Jesus, we believe that the scriptures are the inspired word of God. And we should therefore not judge the scriptures based on our experience, but we must test our experiences in light of the word of God, the testimony of the scriptures. You see, the word of God is the final arbiter. It is the umpire in matters of faith and doctrine. Now, as we have already observed, the Judaizers advocated that the Galatian believers should revert to keeping the Mosaic law as the basis of their salvation. 
And so Paul therefore addresses whether the scriptures really taught that the keeping of these laws was the basis of salvation. It goes to the very document. After all, the law was given by God. And in addressing this issue, Paul takes them back to a period before the law was in existence. He takes them back to the time of Abram, who was acknowledged and revered as the father of their nation. And Paul makes the powerful point that Abram was saved, not by keeping the law, but saved through faith. In Galatians 3 and verse 6, the apostle quotes from Moses, the lawgiver, who wrote the book of Genesis to support his argument. This is what he says. Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. That's found in Genesis 15 and verse 6. The meaning of the word credited in the original language is to put to one's account. Put to one's account. In other words, God placed to Abram's account God's righteousness on the basis of Abram's belief in God. It was not on account of any work on Abram's part. It was not earned. This was the testimony of Moses and the scriptures. So Paul's argument is that those who believe in God like Abram are similarly treated by God and are therefore ch Abraham's children. That's what verse 9 of our text says. These are rather provoking statements by Paul have regard to the sensitivities of the Jews who prided themselves on their lineage being traced to Abram as the basis of them being children of God. Paul is here, however, reiterating the teaching of Jesus regarding who are the real children of Abram. You know, in John chapter 8, verses 33 to 47, in your own time, you can look it up. Jesus shockingly pronounced to a Jewish audience that they were not children of God by reason of their physical descent from Abram. I want us to drop in on the discussion between Jesus and the Jews who are debating this issue with Jesus. And they, they, as it were, they wanted to out Jesus. They wanted to cancel Jesus. In verse 39 of John 8, as we jump into the conversation, we read this. Abram is, their, is our father, they answered. That's the Jews. They are saying, Abram is our father. And then here Jesus' response. If you were Abram's children, said Jesus, then you would do the things Abram did. Verse 40. As it is, you are determined to kill me a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abram did not do such things. You are doing the things your own father does. Hear the response. We are not illegitimate children. That was like a slur against Jesus because they knew of, of, of the conditions in which he was birthed. So they said, we are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. That's what they said. Jesus said to them, look at verse 42. If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and now I'm here. I have not come on my, on my own, but he sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. Now hear these words. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desire. Why? Jesus don't ram. You see, in God's kingdom, salvation cannot be inherited by family line. The godliness of your parents or four parents is of no significance to God. God has no grandchildren. In fact, the stunning teaching of Jesus is that those who have not placed their faith in Jesus are under the paternity of the devil. Your father is a devil. Despite your lineage or your ancestry or religious background or lack thereof. This is radical teaching. And as proof that salvation could only be obtained through faith and is not based on lineage, Paul points out that the gospel was announced to Abram in advance, that all nations will be blessed through you. That's Genesis 12 and verse 3. The Jews, therefore, had no exclusive right to salvation. It was, however, the plan of God that through them, it was through them that he would bring his Savior, Jesus Christ, and bring salvation to the world. And so it is therefore evident from the scriptures that the plan of God was that salvation or justification, which we defined as God's act by which he declares the believing sinner righteous. It was God's plan that salvation should come to all peoples, that's Jews and Gentiles alike. How? Based on faith 
in Jesus Christ alone. And so it's a good time to ask the question again. Let's ask ourselves some questions. On what are you relying for your salvation? Are you trying to be right with God based on the pronouncement maybe of a priest or a pastor or some other religious leader? Or maybe on your church attendance or some relationship with a Christian in your family, maybe your grandmother, or maybe your own goodness or good works. I want to submit this morning emphatically that if you are attempting to do so, you are in mortal danger. Paul is saying that this cannot save you. You must personally put your faith in Christ alone. That's a very personal choice. No one can make that decision for you. And Paul continues in verse 10 of our text by pointing out the futility of trying to gain salvation by observing the law. That is by human effort. He quotes in verse 10 of Galatians 3 from Deuteronomy 27 verse 26, which says, Cursed is anyone who does not continue to do everything, underline that word, everything written in the book of the law. This means, what this means is that is this, that any breaking of the law, whether it is large or small, puts the lawbreaker under a curse. As Warren Wearsby puts it, law demands obedience in all things. It's not a religious cafeteria where people can pick and choose. And who among us can claim never to have sinned or not to have broken at least one of God's laws? And Paul's argument is that if you are to rely on observing the law as a basis of your salvation, then based on the scriptures, you are cursed. You are set aside for judgment. And so the big question then is, how then can a man be saved? The answer is in our text, the righteous will live by faith. Verse 11. And this is actually a quotation from Habakkuk 2 and verse 4. And earlier on in Galatians 2 verse 16, Paul puts it this way. Know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but how? By faith in Jesus Christ. And in Galatians 3 and verse 12, Paul quotes from Leviticus 18.5 to show the incompatibility of trying to live by the law and the way of faith. So there's law and there's a way of faith, a way of grace. And Leviticus 18 verse 5 says, The man who does these things, that is keep the law, will live by them. The law therefore stressed doing or human effort. Us doing or human effort. The law says, do and live. That's what the law says. But God's grace says, believe and live. This brings me to Galatians 3 and verse 13, which I believe is, for me, another of those almost unbelievable verses in the Bible. It says this, Christ redeem us from the curse of the law, by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. The word redeemed used in this verse means to purchase a slave for the purpose of setting him or her free. You know, it is possible to purchase a slave in order to keep them as a slave. You know, just exchanging um, slave owners. But this is not what Jesus Christ has done for those who believe in him. By giving his life, the shedding of his blood, Jesus has paid the price for our freedom from the curse we were under by our sin and inability to keep the law. The objective of salvation is not bondage, but full freedom, and it is all by God's grace. Is there a hallelujah? Is there a praise the Lord in your house? The objective of salvation is not bondage, but full freedom which comes to us as a result of God's grace. How did Jesus do this? How did Jesus make this happen? By substituting himself for us as an offering for our sins. It was by submitting to the humiliation and degradation of the curse that was upon our lives because we were breakers of God's law. Again, Paul quotes from the Old Testament to support this argument. This time, he quotes from Deuteronomy 21, verse 33, to the effect that anyone who is hung on a tree is under a curse. Curse is anyone who is hung on a tree. The Jews did not kill criminals by crucifixion, but stoned them to death. But in cases of shameful violation of the law, 
their body was hung on a tree for all to see, and after a period of time, they were buried. And so being hung on a tree was a source of great humiliation. Jesus' death, and this is so poignant and powerful. Jesus' death on the cross was therefore horrific, shameful, and despicable. This was a death for someone cursed. And this is the death Jesus, the innocent Son of God, suffered in your place and mine to release us from the curse over our lives. And what makes Jesus' death so, 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 so significant and powerful was his integrity and the absence of sin or any guilt on his part and his willingness to do this, to die for sinners. That's for you and me. And this is why the Son of Man came into the world, the scriptures tell us. He came to set us free. Jesus' innocence was confirmed at his trial. Pilate said, me no find no fault with him. There was no fault in his pure trump up charge. There was and is no human being on this planet apart from Jesus who could honestly claim to have lived a sinless life. As such, Jesus was the only one who could, because he was sinless, pay the price for our sins and legally set us free from sin. In one word, redemption. Is there a hallelujah in your host? And Paul tells us that the effect of Jesus' redeeming work is that all who by faith receive Christ experience the blessings God had promised Abraham. That's what verse 14 of our text says. You know, this gospel is hard for many to accept. The Muslims, for example, though acknowledging that Jesus is a prophet, reject the idea of him being Messiah because they cannot accept that God's Messiah would subject himself to such degradation. This, however, is the love and grace of God extended to sinners. It answers the questions regarding human suffering. You see, God enters into our brokenness. He's not distant. He enters into our woundedness in order to make us whole and set us free. He's a personal God who wants to be your father. He's not aloof from our experiences and our suffering, but desires a deep, intimate, and dynamic relationship with each and every one of us. Will you pause today and hope, open your heart to him if you have never done so? And believers in Jesus, I want to just encourage you today. Let's place all our cares on him. Jesus dying on that cross and rising from the dead means that God is for us. He is with us. And beyond that, he chooses to go through all of our sufferings with us. He's with us and he will take us through. Trust him. And so when we reject Christ, therefore, we are, as it were, spitting in the face of God's unconditional love, demonstrated so clearly on the cross to save us from our sins. And we therefore need to wake up, as it were, and smell the coffee. God's grace is available. Accept it. What have we said so far? We have ex ex examined the, the experiential argument. We have examined the scriptural argument for the gospel. Let's now examine the third argument, the legal argument, verses 15 to 29 of our text. Paul now goes on to argue from everyday life experience that the Judaizers' doctrine of salvation through observance of the Mosaic law, in one word, it is it's bogus, it's false. And Paul's argument is this. You know, in human relations, when parties enter into legally binding contractual relationships or covenant, no one apart from one of the parties to this legal arrangement can properly set aside or vary the terms of the contract or covenant. And so, for example, if Joe and Mary enter into a contract, only Joe or Mary can properly make changes to their contractual arrangements. No one else. In similar ma ma manner, therefore, the covenant that God made between, God, between himself and Abram and to your seed or offspring, meaning Jesus Christ, as the scripture speaks of, can only be altered or set aside or varied by these parties, which note, do not include Moses. The promises made under that covenant cannot therefore be set aside or varied by the law, which was given through Moses, who was not a party to the original covenant, and which law? 
was given over 430 years after God's covenantal promises were made to Abram and his seed, which was Jesus. In other words, the law cannot set aside or vary the covenantal promises of God. In fact, when God made covenant with Abram, he put Abram to sleep and unilaterally, that is by himself, made unconditional promises of blessings to him and his seed. In other words, there was no human work or input to be made by Abram in order to obtain God's promises. And this is again a powerful expression of God's grace. Accordingly, in verse 18 of our text, Paul makes the point that it would be incompatible with the promises made by God for one to know, have to work to keep the law in order to derive the benefit of the inheritance or the promise of salvation, which God had already freely given. This was never the plan of God. Now, I can hear some of us asking at this stage, a very legitimate question. Why then did God bother to provide the law? What is the purpose of the law? Verse 19. Is the law opposed to the promises of God? That's what verse 21 says. As Sherlock Holmes would say, elementary Watson, elementary. The full answer is provided in verses 19 to 25. In one sentence, however, verse 24 of our text captures the purpose of the law. Here, it's, this is what it says. The law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law and the promises of God are therefore not opposed to each other, but they are complementary. It's because of man's sinfulness, God sent the law as a means by which we would be fully aware of our sinfulness. The law therefore serves like a mirror plainly reflecting the failings and sinfulness of man. The law was like a schoolmaster, a teacher, pointing the errant or failing students to their need of a savior. The law, however, was for a specified time. It was to remain in effect, in effect until the seed, that's Jesus, the promised one spoken of under God's covenant with Abraham until Jesus came on the scene. And Paul goes on to point out the inferiority of the law compared with the way of grace, the promises of God. The law was put into effect, he tells us, or transmitted to man through angels by a mediator. That's Moses. A mediator, as you may know, represents two sides. Whereas the promise was given directly by God, who is one. There was no mediator. And so if life could come by the law, then one could be made righteous by the law. That's what Paul says in verse 21. But the whole world is a prisoner of sin, so the law can't save us. Verse 22. Paul puts it this way in Romans 3 and verse 23. He says, For all, all are we, have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the reality then is that our karma is truly dark. We know God's righteous standards because of the law, but we are incapable of attaining God's righteous standards. So for instance, the law says, thou shalt not lie. And who among us can say, I have never lied? And further, the standard is if you break one law, you have broken all of them. So, so, so the big question then is, what does God do in all of those circumstances? We are in a predicament. You know what God does? He makes his righteousness available to us as a free gift to be received by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Is there a hallelujah in your house? He makes his righteousness available to us as a what? Free gift to be received by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. And so the law is therefore not incompatible with God's promises, but in fact, produces in us a realization of our need to place our faith in Jesus Christ. The law leads us to Christ. That is the purpose of the law. And in light then of the provision of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, we are therefore no longer under the supervision of the law, verse 25. In fact, we are all now sons and daughters of God, verse 26. And this is not a gender issue, but means that we males and females alike have the same rights and privileges of a son who has come of age and is therefore entitled to share in his or her father's inheritance. There is no more need for trustees. The inheritance is ours in Christ. I'm no longer a slave to fear. 
And for those of us who have identified ourselves with Jesus Christ or clothed ourselves with Christ, this matter of racial distinctions, gender distinctions, economic distinctions are irrelevant insofar as our standing before God is concerned. Galatians 3.28 is an amazing verse. It says, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor female, for you are all one in God. Christ Jesus. We have the same locus standi, that's Latin, which means right of standing before Almighty God and are equally entitled to the rights and privileges of being an heir in God's kingdom and must treat each other as such. And all the promises made to Abraham and his seed, that's Jesus Christ, are ours. We are all one in Christ Jesus. Verse 28, which I just read, is perhaps one of the most radical and powerful statements regarding freedom justice and equality. This statement was made long before woman's lib or the work of the abolitionists. As a matter of fact, this portion of the Bible was hidden from the slave. This was declared by God through the apostle Paul before the civil rights movements and so on. This statement has served to liberate many. What's my point? Freedom, justice, and equality for all are found in Jesus Christ. If you agree with me, say hallelujah. Amen. And Paul has demonstrated then from the experiences of the Galatians, the scriptures, the biblical evidence, and everyday legal principles that God has made provision for our salvation through Jesus Christ and in him alone. What lessons may we learn from our text today? I believe one lesson is that the conduct of the Galatian Christians teaches us that head knowledge of the truth does not guarantee immunity or protection from deception. Head knowledge is not, not enough. Another lesson is that it is possible to accept the truth and to abandon it. Foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who, 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 who fool enough? There is a raging war for the souls of men and women in our world. Many Jamaicans, for example, have been exposed to the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether through churches, media, broadcasts, outreaches, and so on. However, I've witnessed that many who have, may have been exposed or, 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 and, and have expressed a belief in this gospel at one time, I've seen it happen over and over. They abandoned their faith. I've seen colleagues, you know, Christian and go to university and so on, and I speak particularly to even students who are heading off to college and so on, where we, we abandon our faith because we are being bewitched by all kinds of worldly philosophies. I want to warn you to pay attention to the word of God. And sadly as well, many hear the gospel repeatedly and persist in a course of rejecting it and become, as it were, inoculated from its effect. They hear the truth, but they are, we, are, we are unwilling to embrace the truth. And so in closing, therefore, I must ask you, do you have a personal experience of faith in Jesus Christ? And if not, will you accept God's offer of forgiveness for your sins and yield to his leadership in his life? This is an offer of freedom. And I need to ask as well, have you started by faith but have lost your way and therefore given up your freedom and need to return to Christ? God's grace means that he will accept the repentant sinner. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Such is the love of God. I want to say to those who have, as it were, lost your way, begono, come home. Recommit your life to Christ. And the truth is that some of us believers aren't even aware of how much we have drifted into living life depending on our own efforts instead of by faith in God. What is your prayer life like? What, what have you not prayed about? On whom are you therefore relying? Answers to these questions can point us to, to, to see where, what, what is the, the North Star, so to speak, of our life. I want to urge you today, as I urge my, myself, to avail ourselves of the privileges of being heirs in God's kingdom. Let's model the life of grace and be promoters of God's grace, freedom, and justice for all which is anchored in Jesus Christ. Let us ask God for his grace to enable us to continue to live faithfully as sons and daughters of the living God and live and be free. Amen.
Let us pray. Let us pray. Join me in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your law so that we would know your standards and realize that we cannot meet them on our own. Your law, Lord, has pointed us to our need for salvation through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And today, Lord, I want to thank you for your gift of grace and ask forgiveness, Lord, for the times we have substituted human effort, self-reliance, and ways of the world instead of trusting and depending on you. Lord, our lack of faith in your grace has been reflected in our prayerlessness, our worry, and stressful lives. Forgive us and restore us, Lord. Lord, we acknowledge that at salvation, we received your spirit simply by faith in you. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. And today we want to repent of any other way of trying to be godly, including by, by relying on religious formulas, spiritual practices that are not of you, and depending on the ministry of specific prophets or other ministers. Lord, open our eyes to any deception in our lives and lead us even this day, Lord, into your truth. Cleanse us from all sin as we humbly declare our total trust, commitment, and dependence on you. We return, Lord, to your way of grace and ask by faith that you fill us again with your promised Holy Spirit so we can live free. Lord, empower us afresh to intentionally, lovingly, and without prejudice share your grace with others by our lips and by our lives. We pray all of this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe I'm speaking to some folks who you may have been on the track, so to speak, but you have maybe abandoned your faith. I want to encourage you to speak to the Lord today and return home. I believe also I may be sharing today with folks who have never given your life to Jesus. You have never opened your life to God's grace and accepted his gift of salvation. I want to pray a prayer by which a sinner acknowledges that they are outside of God's kingdom and ask Jesus to be the leader of your life. If you'd wish to do so, you have never received Christ before, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to me today. I acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. I acknowledge that I am a sinner and I cannot save myself. Lord Jesus, I ask you to cleanse me of my sins and I invite you to be the ruler, the leader of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me power to live for you from this day forward. Amen and amen. The word of God says that those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved shall be delivered. And if that's you, I want to welcome you into the kingdom of God and we want to make ourselves available to help you on your spiritual journey. At the close of our service, um, there will be several numbers on the screen. We ask you to reach out to us. Anyone who is listening today, you may, 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 wish to, you may wish to tell us that you have received Christ or you may be a Christian and you're maybe struggling in an area of need. We make ourselves available to serve you. Join us in another song of worship, after which I'll do our benediction. Oh
our God is indeed great. Great are you, Lord. Let's now share our benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with us all, even now and forevermore. Amen and Amen. God bless you. To receive personal, confidential prayer, call, email, or text. WhatsApp or call us today up to 11.30 a.m. at 876-521-9437 or 876-877-9794 and 876-371-0898, men only. Or email your prayer request to prayer at swallowfieldchapel.org or by text at 876-395-7694. Visiting with us for the first time? Welcome! We invite you to complete the contact card in the link below to connect with us. God bless you. Thank you for giving in these troubled times. We invite you to continue to give as the Lord enables you to support our ministries and those in special need. Here are a few convenient ways to do so. You may deposit your tithes and offerings in the drop box at the church office at number 7, Mondays to Fridays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Tides and offerings can also be done by direct online deposit to our Swallowfield Chapel, BNS New Kingston, current account number 804161, branch number 50575. Or you can log on to swallowfieldchapel.org and click Give to make your direct online contribution. Financial contributions for food care packages should be so indicated. In-person services will now be held in the sanctuary at number 9, Swallowfield Road, at 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. No registration will be required. All COVID-19 protocols, including physical distancing, will be observed. Arise, our women's ministry continues its I've Come Alive, New Freedom in Christ series on Friday, February 25 at 6.30 p.m. via Zoom. Our speaker will be our sister Charmaine Smith and the topic, As a Woman Thinketh. And remember, all are welcome to join us every weekday morning and on Saturdays for our online prayer meeting from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 a.m. Click and share the link in the description below. Remember to share the link to our services with family and friends at home and abroad and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And here's a reminder to stay safe, wear your mask, wash hands regularly, sanitize, and maintain physical distance. May God bless you and keep you always.